for a long time, the football has been down here because they scored with it. I mean, they scored big time with to promote M2C and Sith down here. Yeah, gotcha. These articles, though, were very interesting because they moved the football this direction. Now, they, they kind of fumbled about here, so they haven't made it all the way to the goal yet. But it's it, it was very significant that they made this much progress. And down here is clarity, my first principle, right, of no more contention. Right. I need to bring that clarity, charity, and understanding, but it's the facts, church history. They're at this end. They're not down at this end. They're down at this end. And then you have Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery, Yerman Thumman, Hill Kamara at this end. So I found it very interesting that these two articles in the Liahona for March moved the football down this direction. So this direction. So let me explain how they yeah, did it. Yeah, I was going to say, okay. There are no cats in America. You need to watch Bible. Welcome to. Hi, I'm your I am your host, Rod Serling, and this is the Twilight Zone. This is the story of the guest who was not there. That was dumb. I'm not, I'm not using that. I'm not using that. Hey, originally we said we were going to do like 30 minutes on each one. I know. I'm hour. sorry. I'm sorry. Let's let's do this other one. Can I wear my Kimura hat? Yes. By the way, bo- by the way, folks, Jonathan Neville is a good friend. So the other day we did a video and we're we're getting in a heated debate because I think Jonathan um, looks. He that's what made him a good attorney because he looks at life like it's an argument, right? It's a debate. I'm joking. <laughs> But no, he needs like to this. watch an American tale because there were no cats in America. There were no cats in America. You never saw that uh, Bible. Remember uh, American yeah, I, Tale, I the cartoon it. where American it shows tale. the mice. <laughs> it's a cartoon yeah. movie and the mice, they sail from Poland to right. America. And it's the yeah. Polish started coming after the Irish. First, the Irish were coming from like the the Gilded Age, from post World War no, sorry, post Civil War up into the turn of the century. Most of the Irish were just coming over, and then the Poles, the Polish, right? So Fivel is the little mouse boy, and his dad says, "Fivel, there are no cats in America. Yeah, <laughs> they're they're mice." <laughs> so. Well, then he finds the out that-, that there were cats. So your argument is there are cats in America. And my argument is... You know, in, in, in Utah, when they, uh, they imported Greeks and Italians to do work in the mines, but they, they didn't bring women with them. And so to entice women, they would send pictures back. And they had photographers go down there that would unroll these murals of beautiful mountains and snow-capped and forests and lakes and stuff they would stand in front of these murals and take the picture and then send it to um to back home to greece and italy to entice the women to come they'd get off the train in like price utah where it's a desert and they would say well this isn't the right place because look at the picture and the guy would show up and say well the picture was an exaggeration oh my goodness (laughs) and they did that over and over and so yeah, people were enticed to come to America on false pretenses often. We even have a hymn about that. Think not when you come to Zion that everything will be great. Well, I mean, that's life. But as far know, as, but as, well, okay. People in England that joined the church, a lot of them thought that they could come to America and be rich and everything would be awesome. No, I think most of them wanted to come here because it was very cluttery and crap. Have you ever looked? gone through history about that time like the mid 1800s and the the elizabeth the uh the elizabeth not elizabeth wait yeah no sorry uh victorian age during the victorian age in england it was not good just like it wasn't good in new york right new york was pretty bad too yeah so i guess all relative 
It's all relative. Yeah. All right. Well, the- even today, I've been in England and I've been approached by people who wanted me to sponsor them to come to America even today. So, you know. You have points there. I think I still love my country. I love America. I'm glad you do. And I do too. And I'm glad everybody loves her. I'm not country. saying you don't. I'm saying yeah. you got to understand where we're, we're going to get into the meat and potatoes of this. We better okay. do that. We just got off of uh, another program where we were uh, debating. Uh, but I need to um, fortify my argument. It's kind of weak. And, yeah, you need to realize that other people in other countries feel the same way about their I countries. do. I'm not naive. I know that. Okay. You cool. need to understand that I am all powerful and all wise and all knowing. <laughs> I, I do need to learn that. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> all right, Jonathan, welcome back, my good friend. I love you. What is that hat? Happy to be here. This hat is from the Camorra Academy, which I got over in um, the Czech Republic. There's a, a private kind of university there for college students. Nice. And it's called the Camorra Academy. I love their their logo. And we visited it. It's a fantastic place for LDS students from around the world, really, mostly from Europe and Africa. But they can go there and learn gospel principles in the university. That's um, They have guest lecturers from other universities that come in there as well as their local staff. And it's in a beautiful location, you know, an hour or two south of Prague. Sweet. So I just like the hat. So Beautiful. Do you have pink eye right now? Yeah, I got, I jammed my eye here. Oh, no. Bit. Not a pink eye. It's in it. A blood vessel burst. You get a priesthood blessing. Get a priesthood blessing. Yeah, it's almost gone, actually. I think. <laughs> I should be <laughs> emphasizing it, I guess. <laughs> One of these That's days, funny. I'm going to... So before we go on, because what are we talking about today? Well, you, I had posted an article about the latest uh, Liahona that you wanted to talk about. Yes. Yes. Can you share that? Yeah. I'll pull it up right now. This is the Liahona. Everybody can see it. This is the March issue. And inside of here is a section that's called um, the uh, United States and Canada section. Okay, and there's there's two articles in here. One is called The Miraculous Translation of the Book of Mormon by Garrett Dirkmatt, and the other is Witnesses of the Gold Plates of the Book of Mormon by Mark Ashurst McGee. And if, if those readers who know about the Liahona know that it's available in, around the world in different languages, and there's regional supplements. This is a supplement only for the United States and Canada. So people started asking me if I'd read these articles, and I hadn't seen it yet because we were out of the country, you know. Right. And so when, when, when I got it, I opened it, and I said, okay, Miraculous Translation of the Book of Mormon by Garrett Dirkman. I thought this would be great. It says, the scriptures and scribes and witnesses of the Book of Mormon shed light on how the prophet Joseph Smith translated it by the gift and power of God. And I thought, okay. <laughs> knowing, knowing Garrett Dirkman, I thought, okay, it'll be interesting to see how he how he does this. So I ended up, um, I went through it. There's a little sidebar here that points out the Book of Mormon has been translated into 92 languages. Um, so that's interesting. But of course, it has this picture of the stone, the seer stone, Dan. Right. And then but no per, has, no pictures of a Urim and Thummim, right? No. It does have our picture of the the infamous hat and the plates covered up. And this this is an interesting one. This is a picture from the um, rebuilt home of Joseph and Emma in Harmony, Pennsylvania. And I've talked before in my uh, presentations about how we visited there the, the day before it opened. My wife and I were in the area. They had barriers across the parking lot but i thought i'm not gonna be able to come back here so we went in there the the first we drove around the barriers and parked and they were doing a, a tour for the local members and the the guides there the missionaries were doing their very first public tour with a handful of local members and we just joined the tour 
And so we we went in here and and they occasionally the guides would ask me because they they knew I had knew some things about church history and they'd say, did we get that right? And I said, yeah, yeah. And then a couple of things I'd say, well, actually, you know, da 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 da. So, but when we got to this point, I lifted up this cover here to see how they had was what was under the cover how they had done the plates right and i took a picture of that and later some missionaries told me that they were told never to lift up that cover (laughs) and and their whole mission they never lifted up the cover and i thought seriously i mean that's the first thing i would do when i see see something covered up and see what's underneath there but anyway so they had the hat here and i asked okay wait 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 these are missionaries that worked there yeah that were where is that again this is in Harmony, Pennsylvania, the priesthood restoration site. Okay, so these missionaries were ones that would take people on tours and stuff, right? Right. Yeah. They were told never to what? That's that's what one set of them told me, and I thought, okay, you know, whatever. Do you think Don't they were trustworthy? When did you believe them? When they, I mean, they have no I reason didn't to have lie. A reason not to believe them. I just right. thought it was a little bizarre because okay. if you lift it up, there's just some plates under there, I, and then there's. A, a solid section that's kind so of, they're saying don't lift this up for visitors not for themselves okay go ahead go ahead they said just, they never lifted it up so okay just know. curious but yeah so but the reason they have this display like this is to promote the stone in the hat theory and that's what this article does and I, i'll get into it in detail here the second one was from mark Ashurst mcgee about witnesses of the book of mormon so what I'd like to do is a little analogy here to a But football. you understand why I asked yeah. about whether to lift it up for the Yeah. the the uh the visitors versus the visitors. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because I would find it even weirder if they said don't lift it up period. That's <laughs> like Yeah. That's what Go they ahead. said. So I don't, yeah. I don't know. I'm not, you know, I've been out there several times. In fact, one time I went out there and I walked in because I wanted, they have some really beautiful artwork in there. And, you know, I'm an artist, so I always like to see the artwork. And I went in and the missionary couple said, oh, you know, they didn't have anybody there. So they're eager to have a visitor. Right. And I walked in, I said, I'm just passing by, you know, I've been here before. And they said, oh, what's your name? And I said, Jonathan Neville. And I said, Jonathan Neville, we just had a fireside about you last week. And I said, what? They had got my book, you know, about the whatever happened to the golden plates and had done a fireside. Somebody had read the book and did a fireside for the missionaries there. And I said, oh, that's interesting. You know, I didn't know people were doing that. And they, they said, oh, it was fascinating. It explained all these things in church history. It was great. So <laughs> I've had some some several experiences at that site. Interesting. We, someday we should do a review of that site someday. I that would be awesome. Yeah. yeah. I even have okay. a friend. Sorry, just real quick. I have a friend that I've been talking to that served here. He's from Missouri and he wants me to come out and do like an on. He's going to take me on a tour and do an on location video. Maybe you could come too and we can meet there and do it together. That would be beautiful. You could be the one to take me and we could stay there there for a few days. That would be neat. And I I know a lot of details out there that they usually don't cover on the tours, but that would be neat. I made a little diagram here on my whiteboard that I thought we could use to explain how this all works, these articles. Yes. And I was, well, let me let me back up and, and mention, just so your listeners know, I wrote a review of these articles on my blog, and we'll give you the link. And we, we probably won't have time to go through the whole review, but I just want to cover it in general. Okay. So if you think of, I don't know if you can see, I, I drew a little football field here. So on this end of the field, we've got, the scholars with M2C, Mesoamerican Two Camoras, Sis, Stone in the Hat, and promoted by the Saints book, the Gospel Topics, Essays, Book Mormon Central, and the Interpreter. Okay. And for a long time, the football has been down here because they scored with it. I mean, they scored big time with to promote M2C and Sis down here. Yeah, gotcha. These articles, though, were very interesting because they moved the football this direction. Now they, they kind of fumbled about here, so they haven't made it all the way to the goal yet, but it's, it, it was very significant that they made this much progress. And down here is clarity. My first principle, right? Of no more contention. Right. I need to bring that. 
clarity, charity, and understanding, but it's the facts, church history. They're at this end. They're not down at this end. They're down at this end. And then you have Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery, the Ermin Thummim, Hill Kimura at this end. So I found it very interesting that these two articles in the Liahona for March move the football down this direction. So this direction. So let me explain how they yeah, did it. Yeah, I was going to. Okay, come. go ahead. Okay. So I think it might be easier for your listeners, well, not for your listeners, for your viewers, if I pull that up on the screen, the article up on the screen, because here it's a little hard to see in, in the printed version. So if you would you like me to do that yep. real quick? Absolutely. Okay, I'll share my screen here. And while you're doing that, I was going to say that Jonathan recently just, so I'm still learning evidence as we go. I'm still learning okay. stuff because I don't have time to read all of it. So I learn it from you and I learn it from Rod, Rod Meldrum and others. But one okay. of the biggest things, every time I think this is a big evidence for Heartland, you give me something else. And then I go, that's even bigger, which is <laughs> okay. Joseph Smith basically saying himself that it about Camorra that, 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 that was the hill Camorra, you know, yeah. you showed me where that he, was. He had glad tidings from New York before he even had the book of Mormon four years before he had the book of Mormon because the book was to be revealed. Right. Okay. So let's, here we are. Can you see the screen? Yes. Click on Leah Hona. Click on March. Now here's the list of the articles. If you come, if you scroll down here, it has the regional pages: Africa Central, Africa West, Australia, Caribbean, United Kingdom, Ireland, New Zealand, and then the United States and Canada. The only one of these that I found that these articles appeared in were in the United States and Canada, and we'll talk about why that's important in a minute. So, introduction to the United States and Canada section. That's the one we just looked at on the uh, in the physical magazine. Let's look at the miraculous translation of the Book of Mormon. Now in here, there's you know, Garrett Dirk Matt has a PhD. He's associate professor of church history and doctrine at Brigham Young University. He also worked on the Joe Smith papers. And he says in here, he has some pretty good things. And I want I want to just show here how he organized this. He says, what do the scriptures say about the translation? That's the best place to start, right? And then he says, um, what did Joseph Smith say about the translation process? Then what did the scribes and witnesses say about the translation process? That's, that's the article. So there's the scriptures, Joseph Smith, scribes, and, and uh, witnesses. But I want to point out something here. When he talks about what did the scriptures say about the translation, he doesn't really cover all the scriptures. He covers a few, but he, he talks a lot about the um, this thing with the in the um, book of Alma about the uh, gazelim and the stone, and then he has Wilfred Woodruff who put the stone on the altar in the Manti Temple. None of that's scriptural, but it's listed under the scriptures. So right there to me, where that's where, where is that account from though about Lorenzo Snow? Is that from? Uh... Well, this, Scri this is scribes? Wilford Woodruff. It, I mean, Wilford Woodruff, his, sorry. Wilford Woodruff's journal. So he took the chocolate-colored the chocolate colored stone? Well, it wasn't even the chocolate-colored. It's the um, striated one. The, I, have, okay. I have one, actually, which I have in the other room. I should have brought it out here, but it's about this big. Okay. And it's it has the stripes on it. Right. The one we just saw down below when you were scrolling. Yeah. Right. Yeah, the one that is not what Emma described. She said it was uh, not black exactly, but dark in color. That one's not the one she described. Well, that could have been the chocolate one. But okay, but let me well, ask you something, just real quick. I'm sorry, but I need yeah. to know. Okay. Why? Sure. Why do you think Wilford Woodruff did that? Well, that's a. a, 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 a we can address that. So just Wilford Woodruff. I'm sorry. I wish I had brought that stone out. In fact, you want me to run and get it real quick? Sure. Sure. Okay, let me back up and just, I wanted to make this point about the organization of this article. 
Okay. First question is, what do the scriptures say about the translation? And it's a, a fairly long section here, as you can see. But most of it doesn't talk about the scriptures. <laughs> That's funny. Because he has he has one passage from Joseph Smith history. And one from Ether. One from Mosiah. And, well, two from Mosiah. And then Omni. And then he gets into um, the sacred stones and Urim and Thummim in the Bible. And then he gets into Wilfred Woodruff's journal. And then he gets into Alma and the Gazelum. And then he goes on this long paragraph about President uh, Woodruff putting the stone on the uh, altar in the Manti Utah temple. None of that is scriptural. No, it's and not scriptural, it's not but do you did, did Wilfred Woodruff believe that the stone was used for translation? Well, no, that's interesting because he didn't say that. And, Why do you and, think he would put he, it on the altar? Well, he said what he said here is, um, let's just read what he said. President Woodruff described how Joseph Smith found this particular seer stone named Gazelum buried underground. The seer stone known as Gazelum, this is from Woodruff's journal, was shown of the Lord to the prophet Joseph to be some 30 feet underground and which he obtained by digging under the pretense of excavating for a well. And then... Uh, Garrett says, though that separate st seer stone is less well known by many members than the stones found in the box with the gold plates, which is the Urim and Thummim, but he calls it the stones, President Woodruff revered it as sacred. The day after he dedicated the Manti Utah Temple, he wrote in his journal that he consecrated upon the altar the seer stone that Joseph Smith found by revelation some 30 feet under the earth. Okay. Now, let's... You wanted to talk a little bit about that stone, so let's talk about it just well, briefly. I don't want to cr crunch your time, but just okay. real quick. Let's, I just... let's do it real quick. Okay. So here's a replica of the stone, exact replica. This is what it looks like. And you can see, there, we showed the picture of it from the enzyme a minute ago, but it's striped, right? Oh, it's a lot Emma bigger than what I thought. That's big. Yeah, it's about the size of an egg, a okay. chicken's egg. I always thought um, it was like, like that, but go ahead. Yeah, no, you could get a whole sentence on here. <laughs> but <laughs> the uh, now, so, if so it was the, sacred, you're going to go to hell. That's pretty true. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty might, true. I mean, here's the provenance of this seer stone, supposedly. That when when uh, Joseph Smith finished the translation of the Book of Mormon, he gave it to Oliver Cowdery because he said he didn't need it anymore. And I, that makes sense to me because he was using it only for demonstration purposes, not to actually translate, in my view. I think that's what the evidence shows. Then Oliver Cowdery, when he, when he died, his wife uh, gave it to Phineas Young, who is Brigham Young's brother. This is out in Missouri. And Phineas brought it to Utah, supposedly, and somehow it ended up with Brigham Young. It's not clear if he when he gave it to him. But this is cannot be the stone that Emma described because it's not black in color. She said she said it was dark, not black exactly, but dark brown basically. And this one is the, not that. It's it has black. Well, we know that, but but brown. you have argued before that Emma was not um, inconsistent in some of her. Um, That's right, but she was. She answers. could describe a seer stone. If if Joseph, but she had also a seer said that Joseph didn't have plural marriage either, and she was a well. That's a, that's that. a separate. That was a separate thing. This. Well, I'm just saying her character. I'm talking about her character, but go ahead. Okay, but I, there's no reason she would lie or be confused about what the seer stone looked I don't like. Know. The point is, this is not the one she described. Okay. It turns out this stone, the, the way that, that Wilfred Woodruff got it was when Brigham Young died, this this stone was in his estate. And one of his wives, Zena Young, purchased it from the estate and donated it to the church. And so... That's the provenance of this stone. So I've looked into this stone, and I question whether this is the stone that Joseph Smith ever had in the first okay. place. But that because is the stone that Wilford put on the altar. Yeah, that is. But Wilford Woodruff was not... Um, he, well, we don't know that for sure either, actually. But we, what we do know is that this is a stone that the church published as if Joseph Smith used it to translate the Book of Mormon. 
And to me, it looks like a stone that's from a dinosaur's gizzard that's found in Wyoming. And when the pioneers came, they went right through the area of Wyoming where these stones are found. And there's no stone similar to this out in New York that I've ever heard of. So the, what I what in other words, what I'm trying to say is I don't think this is the stone that Joseph Smith had. That's that's fine, but do you think that Wolford Woodruff was inspired by the Holy Ghost to do that? Uh, yeah, let's let's say he was. Okay, I, I no, but no, but no, that doesn't mean that the stone was used for translation, is what you're saying. Yeah, he doesn't even say it was here. If you but, read the quotation here, he never right, says it was used. For right, translation. I got that. But as far as gazellum being buried right. thirty feet under the ground, that's a true statement by the prophet Joseph Smith. It's one of these historical things. I mean, who knows? Wilfred Rudolph said well, that. He wasn't around when Joseph found it. You know, the the thing is... No, but I mean, where is that depiction? Who wrote that about Gazellum? Who wrote that? Who well, the part I read... Okay, there's a part in quotations here. It says, this, I'll, I'll highlight it. Can you see it? Right, I know there? that. But I'm saying, where is that Where, where is I told that? You, it's from? in Wilfred Woodruff's journal. Wilfred George Woodruff's Albert journal, Smith so Family it. Papers. Okay. President Brigham right. Young also described Joseph Smith finding the seer stone. Okay, so Wilford Woodruff got got that story from Brigham Young. Yeah. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. Remember, I wanted to know. I know Wilford Woodruff said it, but I wanted to know where Wilford Woodruff got it. Yeah, from. but remember, this stone that we're looking at is the one that Oliver Cowdery's wife, widow, gave to Phineas Young. It's not one that that Joseph Smith showed to Wilfred Woodruff in Nauvoo. Okay. His, Oliver Cowdery had it. His, after they finished the translation, he had it until he died. So when Wilfred Woodruff talked about the stone that was shown to the Lord and, and 30 feet underground and all that, we don't know where that came from because it isn't the one that he saw in Nauvoo. Okay, okay? but you understand my point. Whether that's the stone or not, I just wanted to kind of understand where that came from. Are these men, these prophets, Brigham Young and 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 Wilford Woodruff, believing that there's some sacredness to a stone? It, yeah. Even though that's not the st might not be the stone. Right. They're believing that's the, that's this. Yeah. That's the only thing. Okay. Yeah, and and everybody agrees. At least all the historians and the sources agree that Joseph Smith had a seer stone. At least one. Here it points out that Brigham Young had three. Brigham Young said Joseph had three. Okay. But they were never very explicit about describing these stones or where they came from, where they were used for. Okay. And so at one at one occasion, Brigham Young said Joseph Smith explained the Urim and Thummim and showed them his seer stone. Wilford Woodruff interpreted that to mean that Joseph showed them the Urim and Thummim. But that's not how Brigham Young Interesting. It. Interesting. So and those are the only two accounts we have from that meeting. But either way, is none of none of them in Nauvoo, saw the stone that Joseph gave to Oliver Cowdery, which is the one that has been on display. That's why okay. I don't understand this. Okay. Why they keep showing that particular right? Stone. And 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 I okay. was just kind of curious about you know there there is more evidence that there was something sacred about a seer stone or more than one yeah. that Joseph had. Yeah. You you've never debated that. You're just saying. No, I don't debate that. I know there's some some people. That think Joseph never used seer stones other than period. The Urim right. But okay, let me back up a little bit. There's a guy named Zenas Gurley who was uh he went around and interviewed everybody he could in the in the eighteen hundreds about this. And he came away with the conclusion that it's clear that Joseph Smith had a seer stone, but he said he used it to satisfy the awful curiosity of his followers. And to me, that makes sense because the um, people like Orson Pratt and others would ask for a revelation. And if Joseph started dictating it, they'd say, no, we want to use the seer stone because they had faith in a seer stone. Was, we've talked about this before, how it was kind of like yes. a prop. In, in the, uh, the Whitmer home, he, yeah. he did a demonstration. And what yeah. you're saying is that was kind of a mock demonstration instead of pulling out the Urim and Thummim. He's like, right. well, it's kind of like this. If, it's kind exactly. of like how I use my seer stone where I go like yeah. this, but you're not yeah. debating. You're not, 
you're not um you're not saying that Joseph might have not used a stone for seeing other things. Yeah, well, I think he said he did. So Okay. Okay. Or at least other people said he did. Okay. In a section that's supposed to be what the scriptures say, he goes on and on about what Wilfred Woodruff said about this seer stone, which is never mentioned in the scriptures. People uh -huh. say, well, uh, Gazelim and, and Alma, that's the seer stone. Well, no, it's not. It, it's, it's entirely unrelated to um, what Joseph yeah. Smith said. Then we get down to what did Joseph Smith say about the translation. And just look at this. This is one short paragraph. And he doesn't even quote in context what Joseph Smith said. Okay. So how is this moving the football down the field, you might ask? Well, if you if you didn't ask, I asked it for you. <laughs> and so Well, I no, I, I, I was just letting you tell it. You go ahead. Yeah, no, that's perfect. But no number eight is from Joseph Smith Church History Times and Seasons. And Church History is the Wentworth letter. But then look at the second one in here. It says, Answers to Questions, Elder's Journal, July 1838. Do you see that in the note here? In note yes. Eight? This is what I call moving the football down the field. Because they never talk about this, this, this reference. Now, the reason I say they fumbled it here is because he doesn't even give us a link. That's now, not... Yeah, 99% of the people who read this article are not going to, well, let's say 90% aren't going to look at the footnotes. 99% aren't going to be able to find this reference because there's no link. And this is, to me, this is intentional obfuscation. It's not academic integrity. Not, it's not academic yeah, integrity. Yeah, this is an online document. You can put links right. here to all this stuff. Well, and they also and, fumble it over and over again when they, when they omit Joseph and Oliver, or Oliver saying... Uh, that it, Joseph said it was used by that Oliver said himself who translated, who attempted to translate said that Joseph yeah. used the Urim and Thummim. Yeah. But let's, let's get back to this. So what did Joseph say about it? He gives us, he, he adjusts the, the writing here. Can I read it? Uh, Joseph sure. Smith did let's not say, publicly. Okay. Okay. Read that. He consistently oh, go, said, go ahead and read the whole thing. Sure. Joseph Smith did not publicly provide a detailed explanation of the miraculous translation. We don't know that. That's that's here. That's his opinion. That's right. Yeah. He consists because Oliver did. He consistently yeah. said that he translated the record by the gift and power of God, but also noted that he translated through the medium of the Urim and Thummim. Right. And see, this is what's funny. If if you this is, it's unbelievable that a historian would do this. Instead of just quoting the passage in context where it's clear, he splits it up to hedge a little bit to accommodate the stone and the hat stuff. And and I'll show you here. Let me let me stop this share and I'll I, I have this available on another uh, Well also is where do we get the idea that the Urim and Thummim and I already know this, but I want you to say it. The Urim and Thummim is very descriptive. It is yeah. described as an hourglass metal uh, where two stones are fastened in their glasses. They're basically, you wear them like you would spectacles. Yeah. And they were right. called the sacred spectacles or they were called the spectacles. Spectacles. Right. Okay. Never okay, once. So, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, let me, let me pull this up again. I'm going to show, compare this to the original source. And, okay. you know, one of the, the basic principles of professional ethics for a historian is to not manipulate the sources. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And I'm going to show you what, what's going on here. Okay. So here we have, go, go back to the article so people can see it. This this part that I highlighted here, well, it's not sharing. There it is. Okay. The, the part that I highlighted here, you can see it's the quotations in this first part. Let me do this. Quotations in the first part, and then it's split up in a separate quotation. Now, I'm going to move over here. I can do it here and show you what the original looks like. I have to move this screen down a little bit to do that. He's almost okay. implying that these two things were said at different times. Well, that, and 
but look at when you when you read it in the actual church history, this is the original reference from right okay. from Joseph. He says, with the records, I'll highlight this so people can see it. With the records was found a curious instrument which the ancients called Urim and Thummim, which consisted of two transparent stones set in the rim of a bow fastened to a breastplate. So he's describing <laughs> the Urim and Thummim in detail, and he omitted. says the ancients called it that. Omitted. Right? Omitted. He omitted yeah. all that. Right. Then it says, through the medium of the Urim and Thummim, I translated the record by the gift and power of God. Yeah. So there's no room in there for a stone and a hat. Hence, he has ellipsis points, right? And when right. you usually use ellipsis points, that means you're omitting something. Or exactly. you're paraphrasing. And you're paraphrasing. Yeah. That's right. And it also doesn't accommodate this idea that the stone that Wilfred Rudra put in the temple in Manti, that Joseph used that for translation. There's no, no room in here whatsoever for the stone and the hat theory. But look out. Now let's go compare that with how he edited this. He consistently said he translated the record by the gift and power of God, which this one says, I translated the record by the gift and power of God. But then he says, <laughs> he says, but also noted that he translated through the medium of the Urim and Thummim. Right. Well, he didn't just note that. That's how he explained it. That's right? very, it's he very sad. the Urim and Thummim and said it came. So to me, that's a complete manipulation of the church it history. It is. It is. And, which is a violation of professional ethics for historians. So it's not academic integrity. No, it's not. It's, it's, it's agenda promoting. So what I um, wanted to point out here, though, is I'm still saying he moved the football down the road, down the field towards the truth. And the reason is that he cited this answers to questions in the elders journal. And I want to show you that. Um, in order to show you that, I think I have to go to a, a different um, screen. Yeah, let me let me stop this share, and I'll pull up this other one because this is really a big deal. If I can show this right, okay. Here we see. Oh, I got to share it first. This is interesting. This is, yeah, this is really amazing. So here is that other reference that he cited, but he didn't give a link to. And this is, I took this right out of the Joseph Smith. Why would he not give a link to it? But he gives well, a link to everything else, right? Well, he didn't even give a link to the Wentworth letter. I mean, he gave, he, he, he typed out the citation. So if someone wants to sit there and retype it, they could do it. But you'd think you could just hit a link, right? Right. It makes it very difficult to find. So, but here's what he cited. It's the Elder's Journal from July of 1838. And I, I zoomed in on it here for your readers. These are a series of questions that Joseph Smith answered. Question four, how and where did you obtain the Book of Mormon? Answer, Moroni, the person who deposited the plates from whence the Book of Mormon was translated, right there he says he translated them from the plates, in a hill in Manchester, Ontario County, New York, which is the Hill Camorra, being dead and raised again therefrom, appeared to me and told me where they were and gave me directions how to obtain them. I obtained them and the Urim and Thummim with them by the means of which I translated the plates. And there it is the right there. There it is. Where, I know. There it is right it, there. It couldn't be plainer. But right? what did he use out of this that he was citing? He, Just didn't, the, he didn't quote it at all. No. All he did was provide a reference. Okay, See but what I'm saying? What was he... Re okay, but usually when you write a reference, you're using something from the reference. What was he using? He didn't in this case. Oh, he just, he just said, by okay. the way, go check that well, out if you want. But yeah, go check I'm it not going to give want. you directions so, <laughs> to where it's at. <laughs> this is what's hilarious. So this section is supposed to be, what did Joseph Smith say about the translation? And he says, well, he didn't really say very much. And then he, he, he takes the two passages out of the Wentworth letter out of context and puts those. And then he has this link over here where this is Joseph Smith's explicit explanation of how he translated the Book of Mormon. And he doesn't even give that to the readers. 
That's amazing. So to me, that's that's a, it's a it's astonishing actually, but, but it's not astonishing given who wrote it because Garrett Dirkmat has been promoting the Stone and Hat for a long time. Right. But let's let's go back to the article. So now your readers have seen what he actually cited. That's mega proof. <laughs> no, no, that that, got, that interview with Joseph Smith that came from his own words. I know. So we've I got know. Joseph's own words right there in that. Is that a famous place? That interview? The, the Elder's Journal, yeah. I mean, famous. It was a publication that they had. And Holy he even, moly. He even, explained, he even explained, Joseph Smith even explained in the issue before this that there was a list of questions that people asked him almost daily. And he was going to answer them in the next issue. And so in this issue, he did. There's whole, He saw there were a lot of questions. This was like the fourth one. and But he explained it perfectly clear. And so Garrett Dirkmat here in his article says, what did Joseph say? He says, <laughs> he says he did not publicly provide a detailed explanation of this miraculous translation. Well, it's a, it was a lot more detailed than what you read here because he doesn't even put what Joseph did say about it. And then he says, in his earliest written explanation of the translation, Joseph wrote that he was, uh, although he was not learned, the Lord prepared spectacles for to read the book. Therefore, I commenced translating the characters. Well, that's accurate. That's from the 1832 history. I, in fact, I can click on that so you can see it. History circa 18, summer 1832. Now look at this. Here he puts a link. So I can click on that. I'll open a new window. And I can open that in the new window. No problem. Right there. Here it is. This was the same guy? Yeah, it's the same article. But this it's is what I'm because... saying. Because it's on the church website. It's on the church's website, but it's so the same like, article printed, the Ahona. So if if he wants someone to go read a reference, he'll put the link in here. If he doesn't want them to read the reference, like in reference eight, he doesn't put the links. He just oh puts the reference. Oh my goodness gracious. Isn't that unbelievable? That is so premeditated. I know. That is so but premeditated. It's I, I but you know what credit. he would tell you? I don't want to but, confuse people and make them think that the Urim and Thummim was used. <laughs> yeah, he might say that. But <laughs> my point here is that he did move the ball down the field for people who do their own research and look up this reference. And that's I, I give him credit for that, because normally they won't even refer to that. They don't mention it in the... Well, he almost has history. to. He can't be a complete academic failure. He can't... He can't come well, across as as completely misleading, but he has to do it. And but that was misleading. I'm sorry, that was misleading. Yeah, it's, it's misleading the way he manipulated the reference instead of quoting it in context to exclude the point that Joseph described the Urim Thummim said the ancients called it the Urim Thummim and it came with the plates. He excludes all that, and then he gives us a, a footnote where he mentions this, refers to this other one, doesn't give us a link. When you get a link that he wants you to look at because it talks about spectacles, he gives you the, the hot link. And then the next one down here is number 10. Wait, but if it talks about spectacles, why would he want you to look at that? Well, because it doesn't say Urim and Thummim. And, and um, well, and he had to acknowledge that. Right. He seems that, okay, so anyway, the next one down here, number 10, goes to the history 1834 1836 and here again is a link and i give him credit for this one too because you can click on this link and it pulls this up and it says here he he was also he also informed me that the hid urim thumb was hit up with the record god would give me power to translate with the assistance of this instrument right so we can see that however there's another section in this 1834 history that contains um, those letters that Oliver Cowdery wrote that he doesn't link to. And I, I don't have the time to get into all that, but this is um, this is just page 125, I guess. Oh, wow. I just noticed that. This is a misleading link. Oh, you just barely, it. you just, brothers and sisters, boys and girls, Jonathan Neville just fig, just found something other, other 
he Jonathan Neville just found another piece of evidence that proves uh, that a scholar was misleading people. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let me explain that again. Wow. This is something else. So if you click on the link here, 10, it goes to history page 121, right? Okay. First, what is, what is the, uh, it's about the Urim and Thummim. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll go back one more time. Yeah. So this is where it says, he also explained the angel has said the Urim and Thummim was hit up with the record. God would give me power to translate it with the assistance of this. Instrument. And there's the number, number 10. There's you click number on 10, that. Click on that. It goes and, to history 1834. And it should be giving you that interview, right? Well, and it does, because it shows down here, it says, um, he also informed me that the Urim Thumb would give me power with the assistance of this instrument. Okay? okay, well, that's not misleading. That's not misleading. But here's what's fascinating. If you go down here to click to another page on both sides, this it, this link only goes to that one page. Why? Well, he purposely. If, wait a minute. If you come he, up here. If you, here's how you get around that. If you come up here, page you can click on the different pages. But but see if you look at the URL, it says one twenty five Joe Smith papers. That's a link that goes only to that one page. It doesn't access the rest. If you come up here, then so you can access the rest of this history. He had to purposely. Um make that happen yeah yeah you did because you normally the link would just have the page number but it would go to that page number in the whole document and maybe the reason he did that is i can show you here the rest of this um history includes oliver cowdery's history of the church there's letter seven and letter four and all that yeah and i'd have to take a minute to remember exactly which page it's on, but it was um, in here where he talks more about the Urim and Thummim, and that part you wouldn't be able to access. It should have been linked in in here as well. Right. Uh, let me see. If, I don't remember what page it was. I thought it was page 53. Or is that just a com... D does that just happen, though, if you link it to that page? Does that just happen to where it doesn't allow you to arrow no. through it? No, it doesn't. Because... You can link to any page in this document. Okay, you link, you just link to it correctly, though. So when you go yeah. directly to that page, why would it stop somebody? That that doesn't make sense unless you programmed it right. to do that. I don't know how he would I'm do that. Go that page. I'm going to show this letter four here. How would it? he program it? Well, it's a oh. setting that you, in this same set of uh the same document this history if you go to page uh what is this page 64 yeah page 64 and 65 this is where uh Mer and i told joseph smith that the history was written and deposited not far from that place right right and it was our brother's privilege if obedient to the commandments of the lord to obtain and translate the same by means of the Urim and Thummim, which were deposited for that purpose with the record. That's a pretty important point, right? Absolutely. And that should have also been included in his uh, explanation, but it wasn't in his article. So, okay. Then you have this uh, thing about the miraculous process produced a nearly 600 page book in about 60 working days. Click on that. And that goes to an article by President Nelson where he was basically quoting um, some research that had been done. That part's fine, even though I think it was longer than 60 days because Joseph Smith himself. First of all, David Whitmer said it took eight months. And Joseph Smith said he started translating in the fall. And they all say he didn't start until April. But that's a minor point. So, so this is my first, uh, my second point about this article. The first point is... We want to know what the scriptures say about it. He doesn't include all the scriptures, and he, he is a diversion into what Wolf Woodruff did with the seer stone, which has nothing to do with scriptures or the, the translation. Right. Second point is, what did Joseph Smith say about the translation process? He, he doesn't tell us what Joseph Smith said. <laughs> he says he gives one, you know, edited version of the Wentworth letter. It doesn't give the one from the Elder's Journal. Right. He gives the one from 
spectacles with the link. The other two, he doesn't give a link. And then he gives the link to the um, the history. This footnote 10 is a history, 1834 to 1836, but it only goes to that one page instead of giving access to the entire thing. You have to know, understand how the Joseph Smith papers work to access the other one. But the people who read this article don't even know about those letters that all no. Calgary wrote. No, and once again, I hate to echo chamber this, but it's it's academic uh, dishonesty. It's it's not integrity at all. I think it is. It should be in here. It was in Joseph's own journal, and he doesn't even have it in here. Right. Okay. Now the last one on here, and this one, this is what did the scribes and witnesses say about the translation process? So he goes through this. Shows the seer stone again. There you go. Just like the replica I showed you. And it says seer stone owned by Joseph Smith. Okay. Well, we talked about the provenance and so on. But he goes through with people who were not, neither scribes nor witnesses. So the heading is, what did scribes and witnesses say about the translation process? He does talk give about Oliver Cowdery. Here he gives, um, he talks about what a group of shakers said which was another uh, obscure reference with no link. He says, another time he explained Joseph found with some, this is another reported by Mormonites in the evangelical magazine. So he gives us not what Oliver Cowdery said. He gives us hearsay about what people said Oliver Cowdery said. Wow. And he doesn't even quote what Oliver Cowdery said. We have two, two specific references. One's in the scriptures, which should have been in the scriptures section. The, the note to the... Um, a great price where Oliver says Joseph, you know, day after day he was writing as Joseph translated by the Urim and Thummers. Right, he right. He doesn't even put that in here. And then when Oliver Cowdery rejoined the church, Reuben McBride wrote in his journal Oliver's testimony about how Joseph translated the, the Book of Mormon with the Urim and Thummim. He doesn't put that in here. Instead, he puts in two hearsay accounts of what Oliver Cowdery said, and even those without links. Then he goes down to Emma Smith. And here's where, remember I said, um, here's note 14. He doesn't give a link to it, but he does, um, he quotes that Emma said the second was a single stone that was a dark color. Right. Well, that's, that's a, an excerpt from what she actually said. He doesn't even give us her whole account. As I recall, I didn't bring it up here, but as you recall, she said, not black exactly, but a dark color. So it wasn't just like the seer stone shown here where it's striped. She said, not black exactly, but a dark color. This one has light colors on it. Yeah. Then she, she says, this stone is in the possession of the first presidency. Well, they don't know that. They don't know what stone Emma saw. Right. Um, and then Emma explained, this is this is pretty good. It has the link to the article in the enzyme. And here you have a link. So if you want to go, you can get a live link to the article in the enzyme. Then it has under 16, it has this Emma's last testimony. Again, <laughs> there's without, no link. No link. And <laughs> her, her last testimony was so not credible for lots of reasons right. we talked about. But nevertheless... He goes down here, and on 17, he, here he cites um, Orson Hyde's explanation. And, and this is kind of funny. This is from a, an English translation of a German tract that he still doesn't give the, the reference to. And I looked it up, and I talked about it in my article. It goes into all this in more detail. That We'll give the link to the readers and, and listeners, too. Okay. But you could get a link. It even has Joseph Smith papers, but he doesn't give a link. Then he had, then next next he quotes Joseph Knight Senior, who was neither a scribe nor a witness, <laughs> and he he quotes his hearsay here. And this is just Joseph Knight reminiscences, Church History Library, Salt Lake City Four. Good luck finding that reference. Right. Anyone who's tried to find these kind of references in the church history library. It's so it's, easy. it's funny how there's some, it, it's, it's just crazy. There's links and then there's no links and then yeah. there's links and then there's no links. Yeah. And every one of those, you knowing full well, because you are 
one I've of looked the them mo- all up. I know. Well, I and you're all. one of the most knowledgeable persons besides Rod and other scholars on yeah. on this particular so- topic, and other scholars to know as you meticulously look through these references, they are intentionally missing links. Yeah, you know, I'm sure Garrett Dirkmack knows this material far better than I do, because but he what, he was been. He's been employed by them, by the Joe Smith papers. And yet he he isn't putting in links in here, even to the Joe Smith papers. And you have to ask, well, why? Why not? Why can't we see the originals? Right. And in, in the case of Joseph Knight, he puts him under this, what did the scribes and witnesses say? Joseph Knight wasn't a scribe or a witness. So it's just pure hearsay. Right. Next, right. he comes up with David Whitmer. <laughs> and this one's awesome. Um, if you click on 19... This is David Whitmer, an address to all believers in Christ. Now, anyone who knows about that pamphlet knows that it's the pamphlet that David Whitmer wrote denouncing Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and the Utah Mormons, saying they're all fallen, they were false prophets, etc. Yeah. And that's the yeah. that's his source here. So wow. and but he doesn't give a link again, because if he gave you the link, people would be reading all the other stuff David Whitmer said. But as far as, okay, this, this is amazing. I'm, I'm a firm believer even more. And I already was that Joseph only used the Urim and Thummim to translate because right. way after the book of Mormon was published, right? Yeah. He's got, he's in that interview and he never mentions the Urim and Thummim along with other sacred instruments or right. he never the seer no, stones. He never and then the angel Moroni showing are the angel sorry the angel the evidence room right exhibit a yeah. through e there right. are no seer stones in in that exhibit ex- no. right? right that exhibition or whatever you call it of of evidence yeah yeah it's listed right in the doctrine of covenants what they were going to see and it doesn't list any seer stone no it says yerma thama liahona the plates you know sword and all right. that but you know seer stone now, once so, again, for those you know, who, yeah, go ahead. Well, well, it's just this whole thing. It, it, you have to take it with a, an element of humor because it's so ridiculous that they, yeah. these historians know darn well what they're doing because they have the references here. They just won't link to them. Right. And, you know, I've gone through this and I think, well, the basic professional standards for historians is you disclose all the relevant evidence, whether it agrees with your theory or not, and you make it accessible to people. And here in this article, now I did, in my article, my review of this, I pointed out that this did go, I'm sure this went through an editing process. So it isn't necessarily Garrett Dirkmack who decided not to put links, not to include what Oliver Cowdery actually said instead of just hearsay about what he said and so on. But I, I, it's hard for me to imagine that whoever edited this article would say, well, we don't want people to know what Oliver Cowdery said. Let's just have what other people said he said. Yeah. It's, it's the difference between uh, firsthand and secondhand evidence. And he just, for whatever reason, chose to use secondhand instead of firsthand evidence. Exactly. And it, again, he gives us a link to it, okay, which he's perfectly capable of doing. And this is the video where... President Nelson says, we know they had the golden plates covered usually. Of course, they were covered usually because Joseph was commanded not to show them to anybody. And then he says, Joseph used these, the Urim and Thummim, seer stones in the hat. Now, that is is an interesting way to phrase it because it's it's not spelled out like it was written clearly. It just says he used these Urim and Thummim, seer stones in the hat. And it was easier for him to see the light when he'd take that position. Now, when I read that, I don't see him saying that Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon with the seer stone. He said he he used these, the Urim and Thummim, which Joseph Smith always said he did, and seer stones, which other people said he did. But he, in my view, he did not use the seer stones to translate. He used it for a demonstration and for other purposes, yeah. like to yeah. like like. Like Gurley said, to satisfy the curiosity of his followers when he would receive a revelation. He didn't need a seer stone to receive a revelation, but his followers wanted him to use the seer stone to bolster their faith. 
And so what President Nelson says here is not inconsistent with anything Joseph Smith ever said. That's a key point. And yet he quotes it as if it is inconsistent. So, and then of course, the last part is the, it doesn't, you know, we may not fully understand how the miracle of translation occurred, which is true, but it's much clearer if you actually tell people what Joseph Smith said, <laughs> you know, then it's a lot clearer. Right. And it's the, the great worth is lies not in this translation, but in the testimony of Jesus Christ, which we all agree with. Okay. Absolutely. So that's that article. But do you see my point? I was trying to be be positive about this. Yes. Show how Gary Stop was, sharing. Okay. Sorry. Because I want to come back to the other article too. But yeah. They, yeah. He moved the football down the field by at least letting people know that Joseph Smith said something in the Elder's Journal, which most people don't know. He fumbled by not providing what Joseph actually said in the right. article, but also by not providing the link. But at least now we have an article in the Liahona that we can all cite that references the elders' journal where Joseph Smith explained all this. So yep. that's football down the field. Thank <laughs> that's you. That's a long-winded no, explanation, this, but this, it's important. This, this was amazing. I, I think yeah. that this is valuable information. Look, I don't believe that you're trying to prove somebody wrong. I think no, what you're doing is... No, Absolutely. I know what you're doing, Jonathan. Right. What you're doing is saying, be on, be a, we need real transparency. We need honesty. Yeah. We need That's integrity. Right. We need, uh, and like I said, you know, real academia, real scholarship is allowing room for, uh, for, for, for different for their, interpretations. Exactly. Yeah. And for there to be um, maybe other evidences for different things especially if you don't have it comes back to book of mormon geography translation it, yeah. it's just interesting how we have these it has to start with the facts and when you have an article like this in the Leahona that doesn't give people the facts how can they possibly make an informed decision absolutely how, how does not giving people the facts both and maybe what well, that's why heavenly father hasn't revealed it because people are are not being honest about about yeah. it if we need to be sure. completely transparent so that we can have the Holy ghost yeah, show sorry. us more it's, and the Lord's not going to give us more information. Well, president and, Nelson in his first talk as, as president said, good inspiration is based on good information. So how do you get good info, good inspiration from bad information or inadequate information? Right. What are you it's afraid of? Are you afraid said. of the truth? If you're afraid yeah, of the I, truth, then you're not in it for the right reasons. That's why I'm I'm perplexed at what's going on in this. Okay, let's look at the other article real quick because there's just one point I want to make on it. Okay. Yep. Go ahead. So this one is um, the second article in the ends or in the uh, Liahona in the United States and Canada section, and it's witnesses of the gold plates of the Book of Mormon. And this one is uh, is good. Mark Ashurst McGee gave a good article here. Um, and I, I talked about, all, I'm not going to go through all the detail that I talked about on here, the things that he omitted and so on. But I did want to show, there's one place in here. Witnesses in Harmony. Oh, what I wanted to give him credit for here is he shows, he shows this uh, painting. And it says, Mary Whitmer was shown the plates by a heavenly messenger. Mm -hmm. And he, he quotes, he talks about the event here, and he gives a citation here, 15. And he has the, um, he says, the quotations and information regarding Mary Whitmer are drawn from accounts of interviews with David and John. Orson Pratt, he has the Orson Pratt and Joseph F. Smith letter, which is good. He has the uh, Andrew Jensen piece, which is the one that where Andrew Jensen changed the whole narrative to say it was Moroni, even though Mary Whitmer said his name was Nephi, Brother Nephi. But then, and this is key, here he has Edward Stevenson's account. And again, none of these are linked. So it's not like they, they're encouraging people to do to go and look at these. But Edward Stevenson is the one who said David Whitmer explained to him that Joseph Smith identified the messenger as one of the three Nephites. 
And for example, this book, this opening the heavens, I've complained about this one many times. Right in here, there's a section talking about this event with the messenger taking the plates. And they just completely omit these accounts because they want people to think it was Moroni who showed the um, the plates to Mary Whitmer. Because if it was one of the three Nephites, as, as David Whitmer, Joseph Smith, and Mary Whitmer said, then that means that the three Nephite took the bridge plates to the Hill Cumorah, to the repository, picked up the plates of Nephi and brought those to Fayette. And then that means the Hill Cumorah is in New York, so they can't have any of that. So they just omitted it from the record. And here, this is why I say Mark was moving the football down the field, because he included these references in his article. He didn't quote from them. It would have been awesome. I mean, it would have been a touchdown if he had quoted from these references here. <laughs> because it would have said, David Whitmer said that Joseph Smith identified him as one of the three Nephites. Right there, as plain as words can be. Right. It would have resolved this whole issue. So he couldn't go that far. He fumbled the ball. But he took it down the field, so I give him credit. So now we, we can we can refer people to this. I can give them the link. People can get the link now and see it. Actually, I have it on my website so anybody can go to it. The second thing to point out here is that the title of this painting is Mary Whitmer and Moroni, which to me is just inexcusable because it's historically in Everybody's passing me up on the Kirtland Temple. Okay, we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> Mary Whitmer was shown the place by a heavenly messenger. That's a better account, better title. So he improved that. Okay, so that's all we need to say about that article. But I just wanted to show that Mark moved the, the ball down the field. He's Definite given fumble. A definite account. fumble. I would definite say a few fumbles. fumbles. I would say a few fumbles. Yeah, a few fumbles. Yeah. But, you know, I give him credit for doing that. So... If people want to see my uh, article on this, it's under LDS Historical well, Narratives. You know, you say you give them credit for doing that, but I'm sorry, but if somebody's representing the church or writing an yeah. article in the Leahona, they need to be completely honest. Yeah, I know. I, I understand but, you're you're giving him credit Yeah, because you're a good man. I well, think and, well, we don't know what institutional pressures they're under, how much editing it went through and so forth. Yeah. So, but it, they're, they're there, dealing with other, things. yeah. Here's two things. Both of them put their names on the article. So it's not like the anonymous gospel topics essays that nobody wants to take credit for. And it's not like the saints book. It was deliberately misleading. So they both put their names on it. They both moved the football down the field by providing the references. They just didn't quote the material they should have. And they didn't provide links to it so people can see it for themselves. So it's a mixed bag, but net net, it's positive. Now the other issue overall is that it's only available to the U.S. and Canada. So now online, it's available to anybody, but in terms of the the printed one, it's not available to saints outside the United States and Canada. They're still stuck with the Gospel Topics essay and the um, saints books. But I'm I'm hoping this represents kind of baby steps toward yeah, it's going to happen. Okay. Absolutely. And, and for your for your listeners and readers, we'll put the link to my in depth article that goes through all this. It's on ldshistoricalnarratives.com. Yeah. And I go through all the links. You can see it for yourself. So you'll have trip. more links, or they could just go to Book of Mormon, uh, Central America. Well, I have I on that one. I just kind of did a summary of it, but it links to this LDS historical narratives, so they could go to all three. I guess you're going to send me more links in the email then. Yep. Okay. I will. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Great. Good to be with you. All right. This was awesome. This was powerful. Powerful. All right. It is. <laughs>